Okay. Um, so yeah, just wanted to. So I'll come back to where we where we started, um, which was this uh, this White Sacker Williams, and I think I gave a kind of unsatisfying derivation, um, but actually a really good analogy to have in mind is that we're thinking about something. The effective photon flux of photons from the nucleus is kind of like a PDF of the the nucleus producing photons. So we, when we when we think about a slightly, and then when we think about a quark PDF at the LHC coming from a, from a proton, right? That quark is virtual inside the nucleus. We approximate it as real. Um, there, here the kinematics is very different. The nucleus is non-relativistic in the CM frame, in the lab frame, everywhere. Um, but the picture is very similar, that we can still think about it as containing in it some, some virtual photons. And then we do something like a photon PDF, that's this alpha chi over pi, and then look at a differential cross section in terms of real photons interacting with the beam electron. So this is this would be the hard process here. Now, when you actually work everything out carefully, and you write the cross section differentially in terms of the a prime energy and cos and angle, the things you care about, there's an additional Jacobian factor, which is what I wrote here. So this is your PDF. This is your hard process cross section, differential cross section. Um, and this is a Jacobian. Um, now this, the hard process differential cross section, I was in the process of writing. Um, it's a little bit of a beast itself. Um, I do want to keep um, this is about the most complicated equation I'm willing to write on a blackboard for this kind of talk. Um, and I'm not going to use the detailed properties of it. Um, but I, I need to also tell you what U is. Um, and I'm sort of running out of space and asked for this board not to be wiped. But what I will do um, yeah, okay, I'm going to need to move. Um, sorry. X, ah, thank you. Um, so X here. is the energy of the A prime over E naught, the energy of the beam. So it's the fraction of the beam energy that's carried by the dark photon. And U is this Mandelstam invariant that I introduced earlier, or minus the Mandelstam invariant, if you use a mostly negative metric. Um, and I'm going to write it in terms of this opening angle theta and x. Um, so If we look at this cross section, one of the first things the, the first thing I want to look at is just where where is this biggest? What what kinematics is going to dominate? And you might look at this and say one over x. So oh, in the denominator, it looks like this is going to be peaked at large x. Except this one over x here cancels it off anyway. Um, so I don't end up with any one over x's in the prefact one over one minus x's or one minus x's or sorry or one over x's in the prefactors. Um, but you do see that the cross section can become large. U is small here. Um, this first term is going to go like ma prime squared over, sorry, ma prime to the fourth, one minus x squared over u squared, and then there's another term that's going to go. 
like u, uh, sorry, from here has an x, 1 minus x, and a prime squared over u. Um, so whenever u is much less than 1 minus x and a prime, that would give you an enhancement. Where it's going to be dominated is at small u. Um, well, sorry. Um, just give me one second here. Actually, you can see here <laughs> that uh, this term is never going to let you get x's. So x, x is between 0 and 1. Um, that would give you an enhancement, but it never happens. Because this contribution to u, every contribution here is positive definite, and this contribution is of a scale 1 minus x and a prime squared. Um, so this term is never more than order 1 compared to these terms, but it's still true that there's a 1 over u squared here, and so small u kinematics is going to tend to dominate, or small, small u over square root of 1 minus x. So if you ask, if I ignore the electron mass for a minute, I ask how to make u as small as possible, I take theta to 0, and then, um, or really I want to minimize u squared over 1 minus x, if we're being careful. So I'll take theta to 0 to make u as small as possible. And then I'm going to get an ma prime squared 1 minus x over x squared, which is minimized when x is approximately equal to 1, i.e. when the dark photon carries most of the beam energy. So we can see from this structure from the 1 over u squared in the cross section that the uh, that the cross section is going to be largest when we think about small angle production and the dark photon carrying most of the beam energy, close, close to all of the beam energy. Um, so this implies that you have your largest differential cross section there. And then in that regime, um, as I was just saying, all of these terms end up sort of parametrically of the same order. They're all order one inside of the brackets, so I won't need to pay a lot of attention to the order one, to the terms inside the brackets. Um, there was an overall 1 minus x over u squared, in other words, the inverse of this scaling. So you can see that the differential cross section goes like you know, d sigma dx goes like 1 over 1 minus x, which means that this is really a log enhancement. in the cross section. Now, with any kind of log enhancement, there's always something that cuts it off. Um, here, there's a cutoff coming from the electron mass term. So there's a cutoff scale for 1 minus x that's going to be of order m electron squared over m a prime squared. When 1 minus x is smaller than this, there's no benefit to going to x closer to 1 um, anymore in terms of suppressing u. 
because this term is already dominating over that term. Um, there's another cutoff that's less explicit in this formulation, but uh, that's sort of a cutoff, um, at least a place where you should be skeptical of the derivation which is when 1 minus x is of order ma prime squared over the beam energy squared, then it turns out that you've, uh, you, 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 you worry more about the validity of this approximation. Um, so that tells us small angles are dominant, large energies are dominant, and I've gotten a quantitative es estimate of what's the sort of scale of energy fractions carried by the electron. So the electron, These correspond to the electron energy fraction. That's typical. Right? Because the nucleus isn't really carrying any energy parametrically. It's non-relativistic. The dark photon is carrying x fraction of the energy. That means that the electron, recoiling electron, is carrying 1 minus x fraction of the energy. And that's the typical scale of suppression for the electron energy. So the electron's going to come off with relatively low energy in a good fraction of these reactions. Um, now, the other question you might want to ask is what kind of angle do you expect the A prime to come off at? And we can, again, see that just by studying the relative sizes of different terms in U. So um, when theta is of order ma prime squared over e squared times 1 minus x. Sorry, when theta squared is of that order. That's, that's when you would start getting a significantly lower rate relative to this PQ. OK? So this is a sort of characteristic scale sort of spread of thetas that you would expect to get. And if I put in my typical, my cutoff value of 1 minus x, which is a typical scale, then I am going to get that this is theta squared. Let me just focus on the first case of me squared over e squared. Um, so theta. would be of order me over e. This, roughly speaking, is the more important cutoff for light A prime. This is the more important one for heavier A prime, right? And so you could get different, different theta scalings for those two cases. Um, the key points here are I just wanted to show you that one can one can really estimate, and then from this theta of the, um, this is the theta of the A prime, then you can also work out the PT of the A prime, which is theta A prime times x times e. And so that's going to look like, uh, well, x is 1. Um, Sorry, I have messed something up here. Um, That opening angle should be parametrically smaller. Um, 
All right, I think, I think the point is that I wanted to use this Hevier prime case instead, um, where 1 minus x goes like, uh, I actually, I, feel, I think I'm still doing something a little bit wrong in the light A prime case, but uh, for the heavy A prime, I'm going to get an extra factor of the same thing. And that implies that the PT of the A prime goes like, Ma prime cubed uh, times Ma prime. Okay, I'm. I've clearly screwed something up both here and in my notes. Um, Will we be able to access like a corrected version? I'll try to access, do a corrected version, yeah. Um, it should be that this opening angle is suppressed further. Um, the And I think there's, there's just some square root issue somewhere. Um, this is the kind of standard typical scaling that you get, is that theta actually goes like a 3 halves power of ma prime over e. Um, is where it's dominated. I'm actually wondering if I just wrote my thetas wrong in that cross section. But no, that's not it. Um, OK. Or if it is, it's wrong on my notes too. So it's peaked quite far forward. And with the electron, then you can also estimate that the electron PT should be of order the A prime PT, um, which is then multiplying this by the energy, something like MA prime to the 3 halves over e to the 1 half. Yeah? Um, yeah, so I'm saying the theta, I, I think it's possible that I, that I copied down that, uh, that equation wrong in both my notes and here, um, and that it should be an E naught squared theta. And then I think, I think everything might work out properly, um, to get, to get this expression. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm having trouble figuring out where the, where, the issue, where the issue is in my notes. But certainly the, uh, the, the opening angle for the A prime that you get out of this, out of this kinematics, and out of, it, all, it all does can be understood in terms of this sort of U minimization picture, is parametrically smaller than M A prime over E, which is the sort of characteristic opening angle scale that you might expect. Um, on dimensional grounds. Okay, so Okay, so now that we've sort of figured out what our u-min is, we can now do some estimation of the cross-section, right? So, um, so the result that you get, and again, I'm not going to try to integrate this in real time because I suspect some, some issues in the, in the equations I've written down. Um, 
So you get a total cross section that roughly scales like four thirds alpha cubed epsilon squared over MA prime squared times this chi factor, which I can estimate as z squared times some log factor, um, which for light, D, light A prime and I mean lighter than about, at E137, lighter than about 100 MeV A prime. That log factor is of order 10. As I was mentioning earlier, if the minimum T required to produce, uh, so the minimum Q required to produce a really heavy A prime is going to increase with the A prime mass, right? MA prime squared over 2 EB. If EB, if that starts inching towards the size of the nucleus, then you no longer get this logarithmic range over which you have a coherent enhancement. Instead, you're sampling, you're integrating over a suppressed falling form factor. And so you get, uh, you can get a suppression rather than this log enhancement. Now, you can compare this to standard electromagnetic cross sections, like say the cross section for conversion of a photon to E plus E minus is a nice one to look at. And that is 7 ninths times 4 alpha cubed z squared over me squared times a very similar log factor. Um, which actually arises from a very similar place. If you wanted to, you could think of the photon conversion as an analogous process with an effective photon flux coming from the nucleus. And since you're producing light particles, you're integrating over this entire space, so you get that full log. Um, now, this conversion process's cross-section is actually a very a very useful thing to compare to. Um, this is similar to the cross section for a large energy fraction Bremsstrahlung. So electron going to gamma with, uh, with that electron carrying a large fraction of the energy. But of course, sorry, with the photon carrying a sizable fraction of the energy. But of course, there's no natural cutoff to use for classifying what's a hard BREM. There's, a, there's a, a, an enhancement of the brem and cross-section at low photon energies. And depending on what region of BREM phase space you'd integrate over, you would get a different fraction. Um, however, I like to think of this quantity here as an effective cross-section for hard BREMs. And the reason is that if I take this quantity inverse, and I multiply it by an appropriate number density, so rho of a material over Avogadro's number times its atomic mass, that equals the radiation length, which is defined as the distance over which an electron loses all but one over e. Energy to Brem. Now, this is not some like unambiguous, right? This is not just the result of hard Brems. This is a result of hard Brems, multiple soft Brems, et cetera. So, this is kind of calling that inverse distance an effective cross section for hard Brem. That's a little bit of a, that's a very imprecise statement. Um, but because this cross section is just related times like number densities to a radiation length, and radiation length is a ba very basic way of classifying materials, um, I think of it as being useful. As you, I find it useful to think of this as a sort of effective hard brown cross section. Um, there was a question that I saw earlier. Yeah. Two. Um, one, should that be inverse radiation length? Um, let's see. I took an inverse cross section and I multiplied it by a density. 
Um, I should have taken... Yeah, I guess you're right. That should be an inverse radiation length. Thank you. Um, and sorry, going back a tiny bit, um, what is this signal conversion? Gamma? Okay, so this is the cross section for a photon to go to E plus E minus. So the cross section for photons to convert to E plus E minus off of nuclei are exactly seven ninths of the sort of inverse radiation length scale. Um, all of these processes are described by essentially the same same are controlled by essentially the same physics, which is this effective photon flux physics times an, an appropriately weighted integral, depending on the exact question you're asking, of a hard process here inside that's either a Compton process for Bremsstrahlung or a, uh, or a, a photon photon to E plus E minus for conversion. Right, And so depending on the exact diagram you're looking at and exactly what kind of weighted integral you're getting, you get, you'll get different, um, different factors here. Um, hence this has the seven ninths. Um, but so the point is that this, uh, I wanted to write down the conversion process just because it's something with a well-defined cross section that I can write down. Whereas this cross section for hard brem is kind of a fake definition of something with the units of a cross section that I got from a radiation length. Um, that's morally like, a, it is morally a cross section for hard brown, but I haven't been very precise about what hard means, right? And in fact, the right choice of what hard means to get this answer would be reversed engineered from the, cross, from the definition of a radiation length. Um, sorry, that was probably super confusing. Um, what I want to say is that this is the dimensional scaling that controls electromagnet normal electromagnetic interactions in material. Is this alpha cubed z squared over me squared times a similar log. And the reason this is useful is because this effective cross section is basically the inverse of a radiation length. It makes it very easy to estimate yields for an experiment from the ratio of your signal cross section to that effective hard brem cross section times the thickness of your the usable thickness of your target in radiation lengths right so um, so your yield if you have now an electron beam hitting some target of an effective thickness of t times x naught your yield can be thought of as sigma total times the number of electrons times the number of density, column density of target nuclei in that material. But the column density of target nuclei in that material is just T over sigma conversion. Sorry, over the sigma hard brim. Um, where really by this T here, what I mean, I'm going to add this, add a subscript, a, a star to it, and T star is the usable thickness. What I mean by that is that for a thin target, T star is just T. For a thick target, I've just told you that in one radiation length, an electron loses a large fraction of its energy. Uh, it starts an electromagnetic shower of much lower energy particles. And so you're not going to get as much production, or by the way, as geometrically focused production, from those secondaries as you do from the primary electron. Um, so you're going to get most of your detectable production in the first radiation length. And you should take T star of order one. It doesn't do you any good in terms of signal to have 20 extra radiation lengths after that electron has already finished its shower. 
right? There's nothing reaching that part of the detector. Um, and if you want to be careful about fixed target yields, you do want to think a little bit about the processes coming from the secondary, from the, from the subsequent electrons and positrons produced in the shower. But for an order of magnitude estimate, you can take T star of one. Um, and so putting everything together now with this ratio of cross sections, we get a yield that is T star times the number of electrons on the target times the ratio of those cross sections is just one third epsilon squared ME over MA prime squared. And so this is the typical scaling of yield sensitivities for any fixed target electron experiment. It always falls as one over mass squared. That's different, by the way, from the story of proton experiments, especially where you're dominated by pions and etas. Because the pion branching fraction to an A prime is mass independent, if the a, essentially, if the A prime is lighter than the pion. And it's zero if the A prime is heavier than the pion. So you end up having these sort of threshold effects instead of a mass scaling. But you'll always see this kind of mass fall off in the yield from any electron fixed target experiment. And it's coming from the fact that this Bremsstollen cross section is mass suppressed. Um, with that yield formula, I can go ahead and estimate what E137 can see for the first case I talked about, which I think is still on here, where I get an E plus E minus pair decaying over here. Um, just very quickly, though, to come back to a question that was asked, why is, you know, why is the three meter detector a reasonable thing to use? Um, if I take, say, uh, and the reason is that the opening angle, the, the direction of production of the dark photon, I said, was very forward. In practice, that only helps you so much if your E plus E minus is, prepared, is produced up here. Um, because the opening angle on these guys is a little bit bigger. It's MA prime over E. Um, so depending on where the pair is produced, your sort of characteristic size of the beam of electron positron pairs coming from the dark photon is going to be either MA prime over E to the three halves for late decays, the latest possible decays, like decays in, in the close to the detector, or MA prime over E to the first power for these E plus E minus pairs that are produced earlier on. Right? If I take a, uh, I said 30 GeV beam, it was actually a 20 GeV beam but 30 coulombs of charge, and I got those numbers mixed up earlier from memory. Um, so if I take a 20 GeV beam and a 10 MeV dark photon, or 20 MeV dark photon, this angle here is 10 to the minus 3. This is like 3 10 to the minus 5. And over a baseline of 200 meters, that would still give me, even for this larger angle case, it would still give me a separation of a sort of typical size of 0.2 meters, right? So the typical size of that, of that electron positron beam that you're getting for light dark photons is still smaller than that three meter detector. Um, as you get to heavier dark photons, this is no longer true, and you start having to account for an angular sort of for an angular acceptance loss in the search. But for the low masses, that's pretty much good enough. Um, so, so this is the total yield, right? And if you just work out 
what this is for NA, for E137, so I'm going to take T star, it goes to one, because this is a very thick target. Um, an electron is 30 coulombs, which is about 2, 10 to the 20 electrons. And then I can approximate this as roughly a tenth epsilon squared times an MeV over Na prime squared. And I would have gotten a few events if epsilon is of order 310 to the minus 10 times Ma prime over MeV. That's the lowest kind of signal I, sh I could hope to find. Um, the discussion of backgrounds for these beam dump events experiments is actually somewhat subtle. There can be beam-related backgrounds, but mainly in an electron beam, you'd worry about things like neutrinos. And the neutrino yield is negligible for when you work it out for, uh, for this process. There's weird stuff called, so like there's something called sky shine, which involves particles produced near the dump going up into the atmosphere and then hitting something. And then you see a signal from the sky. Uh, that have to be rejected. Um, but they got down to an analysis that saw zero events. So a few events signal should be observable. Um, and if you worked out in the plane of epsilon versus mass, so I'll draw some tick marks here at 1 of G MeV, 10, 100, Thousand, so this is a GV up here. And at an MEV, we're sensitive down to epsilon to 10 to the minus 10. 9, 8, 7, 6, 10 to the minus 4. Um, so we're going to get a sensitivity curve, a lower bound that looks something like this, where there's no, so above this, there's not enough A primes produced. To, to detect, and just to sort of set the scale, Babar's sensitivity was way up here. So it looks like maybe we're going to get signals down six orders of magnitude lower in epsilon than Babar could handle. Now, it won't be quite that good when we're done. Um, is it E137 excluding all of this region? Of course not. Most of these events, most of this part, the dark photon was decaying promptly. And if it's decaying to E plus E minus inside of that hill, you're never going to see it. So if you write, draw a line where the dark photon doesn't, uh, doesn't actually pass, doesn't get through the hill, that's going to look Sort of like this. So this is where gamma C tau is about 200 meters at energies of 20 GeV. Um, so above this line, you produce tons of A primes in some cases, but they all decay before you can see them. Now, if that's a 200 meter lifetime curve, then I can just draw lines parallel to it, right? This is a two kilometer lifetime curve. Sorry, this is a 20 kilometer lifetime curve. This is a, uh... oh, I, did that. I did that wrong in my notes. Okay, that's 20 kilometers. Um, so, there's going to be some penalty even in between these lines as you get lower down. Most of the dark photons that you produce, they'll make it out of the hill, but they won't decay before they reach your detector. And so you still don't have a signal. So I need to add, um, if the gamma C tau, I need to add a survival probability, or sorry, a detection probability. So I need to multiply 
by the probability that it decays before what I'll call L shield plus L detector. Um, sorry. Probability that it hasn't decayed by the time it gets through the shield minus the probability that it hasn't decayed by the time it reaches, it's gone past the detector. So L shield and L detector were, this is L shield, the region where any decays in here would be blocked, and this is L detector, the length of the decay region where anything produced there could be seen in the, in the detector. And in the long lifetime limit, this is approximately L detector over gamma C tau. And when you plug in our formulas from the last lectures for gamma C tau, that's going to penalize this factor, this, this signal here, by basically the length of the detector over 100 meters times epsilon over 10 to the minus 5 squared times an MA prime over, oh, okay. I wrote it in terms of 10 MeV in my notes, so let me move it back to MeV for simplicity. Um, so, okay, this is an epsilon over 10 to the minus 4. Um, what, the reason I wrote this down is to note, so I'm multiplying this yield here times this yield, and the A prime mass terms are going to completely drop out. So I actually end up getting a yield at detector, a detectable yield that scales like 10 to the 12, sorry, 10 to the 11, epsilon to the fourth. Um, sorry, not 10 to the 11, 10 to the 29 epsilon to the fourth. And so basically that gives me a number around 10 to the minus seven where sensitivity cuts off. So below this line, I'm producing dark photons. They're surviving to the dump, but not enough decay before reaching the detector. And so that gives you a region with those three boundaries. Not enough produced, not enough decay in time to reach the detector, and not enough decay, and they all decay too early. And that is the region excluded by these beamdom experiments. So I wanted to go through that so that you understand where this basic shape comes from. Other beamdump experiments have different parameters than E137. Some of them had at dumps as short as 10 centimeters, and they did have a little bit of background. Um, so they didn't run as anywhere near as many electrons. That means shorter dump means they'll have an earlier that this upper line will be higher up. Fewer electrons delivered means that you're going to have a higher lower bound. And so they all take bytes that look sort of this shape. Um, and there's a sequence of beam dump experiments that one can see in all of the standard plots here that all have, all have that shape. Um, and this, this basic argument explains why. Um, so now we can talk a little bit. Well, I think the other thing to say about this, if you want to ask how do you improve on one of these beam dump experiments? Um, well, this line is hard to move with the same basic configure, basically, so to move down on this line, you need more luminosity. But this one, like number of electrons times epsilon to the fourth. So you actually need a huge scale up in power in order to get significant improvements here. 
Um, by the way, a low mass is this parameter space below E137 is constrained by supernova, 1987A. And so maybe there's less motivation for trying to get down there, although it would be interesting at higher masses. This upper curve is limited by gamma C tau. So it's exponentially hard to increase the luminosity enough to get enough to, to raise this. Um, what you can try to do is build experiments with shorter, shorter baselines or with higher energies. And so that's one of the appeals, for example, of an experiment like, uh, so phaser is really trying to exploit larger gamma to move a line up relative to, there's a whole cluster of experiments that have comparable exclusions to E137 with both electron and proton beams. Charm, NuCal, they're all kind of lying, overlapping highly. But phaser is trying to push up by increasing gamma. And there's other experiments like dark quest that are hot, trying to move this up by being sensitive to much smaller gamma C taus. Do you have a question? Well, so the thermal, I mean, so yes, yeah, certainly in the region of, uh, I mean, there is, a, there is a mass window where the dark photon can't decay to dark matter, it decays visibly, but this sort of thermal freeze out scaling still works. Um, and some of that lies in this, in this open window. Um, also, I think just if you take this sort of order of magnitude estimate from like one loop, two loop, if the standard model's in a gut, then maybe you expect coupling epsilons for a generic dark sector, whether or not it has anything to do with dark matter. 10 to the minus sort of five, four to seven is a very reasonable range. And that's squarely in this difficult to reach displaced territory. Uh, so I think those are two of the most, those are the two motivations I'd point to. But then, I mean, there's a lot, of, a lot in this business. We've seen two examples where, for very different reasons, you have epsilon to the fourth scaling, like luminosity times epsilon to the fourth scaling so that you have to beat in order to improve on the experiment. Um, here, it's because of this lifetime penalty. In the case of Babar, it's a signal over square root background kind of penalty um, for the B factories that make it hard for that one to push down, um, which I think also makes the, the, I, the question of just how do you use displaced decays to probe some of this region, given how hard it is to scale the, the direct prompt searches down. How can you use sort of clever variations on displacement to probe this, this region? Uh, a, very, a very important question to answer. Because uh, ideally, I would like to see as much as possible of the space, of the mass space, down to epsilons of like 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 7 explored. Because, OK, given that the couplings of the standard model seem to unify, I don't know the details of a gut. Certainly don't, don't want to stake, stake my life on, on any particular gut model. But the idea that kinetic mixing would be suppressed by these extra loop factors because the standard model is in a gut seems very reasonable. And so if you want to go out and explore new sectors that couple to the standard model, this is kind of where I'd expect to see them, most likely. And probing that area with displacement really seems like the only way to go. Um, OK, so one other thing I'll mention just briefly here. Often you'll see, or in some papers, you will see an additional divot here in the E137 sensitivity. What that's coming from is I already mentioned there's a shower. The electrons get in Bremoff hard photons, so those photons convert into E plus E minus pairs. Now you have positrons carrying energies typically less than the beam energy. Um, but still not negligible, that can annihilate off of atomic electrons to a photon and an A prime, or if their energy is degraded to just the right amount, they can even annihilate resonantly to an A prime. And despite not having a Z, fa a Z enhancement or a Z squared enhancement, the fact that this process in particular doesn't have to pay any additional alphas, 
and that there's a lot of secondary positrons in the bean means that this can be a more efficient production mechanism than the brown strolling that I talked about. The sort of downside is that it has a really low kinematic limit because if the, the energy of the positron is less than the energy of the beam, that means that the center of mass energy is less than 2 E beam times m electron, which even for this 20 GeV beam is right around the 100 MeV range. In practice, most of your positrons are softer. And so it only really helps you in this, in this small region, but there is an additional sensitivity gain from, uh, from considering this positron annihilation process. OK, so I already mentioned um, this, uh, the second process that you can look at at E137, where the dark photon decays to dark matter. And then, or you're just producing dark matter through an off-shell dark photon, and then you look for it scattering in a detector. So there, I don't have to worry about any lifetime penalties. I'm producing prompt dark photons. This yield formula still applies. But now I need to multiply by a probability of interaction. And I'm going to say a little bit less about this now, in the interest of time, than is in my notes. Um, there's a regime. So this probability of interaction is going to be a cross section for chi e goes to chi e scattering so that I'm producing a recoiling electron. Um, that scattering actually has a, has a uh, log divergence at low electron energies. But I'm going to cut that off by requiring that, the, uh, that it's observable, which roughly means that the electron energy is greater than 1 GeV in the lab frame. Or maybe it's 3. Um, this experiment was done in the 1980s, not motivated by these models. Um, and it's a little unclear, even you know, talking, to, talking to Bjorken about it, what the, what the right energy threshold should be. They were thinking about things well above this threshold, so it's kind of a guess at, at what the actual sensitivity limit would be. Um, and that cross, so it's going to be that cross section times a column density of the material of electrons. And that cross section is about 4 pi epsilon squared alpha alpha dark over 2 me times the minimum electron energy. This is true for, for the chi and a prime masses less than about tens of MeV. Um, as you go to heavier masses, then this denominator changes because you're now dominated by, uh, prop by, the, by the mass term rather than the momentum scale of the propagator for the scattering. Um, so I'll just use this case for now. The column density in the E137 detector turns out to be the, the column density that occurs early enough that you could actually, like, you need enough detector downstream of the scatter to see it. So that's a, that's a mild penalty. Something like 3 10 to the 25 electrons per centimeter squared. And if I work this out, I get a probability that's at the level of epsilon over 10 to the minus 3 squared alpha dark over 0 0.5 times 3 10 to the minus 7. So this is a very small, even for epsilons that are already probed in this dark matter production context by Babar, this is a very small probability. Um, but 
I can multiply that into the event yield that for epsilon of 10 to the minus 3 was huge. And I still get um, enough events to see for epsilon greater than, so basically yield times p interaction ends up going like 6 10 to the 6, epsilon over 10 to the minus 3 to the 4th, MEV over MA prime squared times this alpha dark over 0 0.5 factor. Um, and if I take my usual benchmark for alpha dark and MA prime that I had motivated, so, so this is greater than a few for epsilon greater than about 3 10 to the minus 5 times MA prime over an MEV to the 1 half. And we can map this onto the uh, Y parameter space in a very similar way to what I was talking about for the bar. Notice here there's actually an alpha dark that appeared in the cross section, but there's still more epsilons relative to alpha darks than there are in the Y definition. And so choosing a large alpha dark is still conservative for, for estimating how this maps onto Y. Um, and maybe I'll just show, let's see. Okay, this is actually not the right plot. So I'll show this one. Uh, source selection on, let's get the projectors down. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so this is Slightly difficult to see, but here is a here's just a, a plot now of this standard way of mapping experiments to Y of current constraints. And you can see E137, despite being a 1980s, early 1980s experiment, is uh, well an LSND, which is also a 1980s experiment, are uh, are really right in there competing with modern experiments like Mini Boon, the recent coherent experiments analysis of dark matter scattering, and uh, NA64, which is a different kind of electron beam experiment that I'll tell you about next, um, getting, getting really good sensitivity in here. Um, I think this is a testament to, uh, I don't know, the power of, uh, <laughs> power of old data and the power of sort of doing an experiment looking for the unexpected and then when new unexpected things come up, often, often it can be constrained. Um, so again though, whoops, for, for E137 and also for these neutrino experiments that I was, uh, okay, look over there, that one didn't disappear, um, <laughs> that I was talking about. The sensitivities that I was deriving all went like epsilon to the fourth. And the reason for that is that I had to pay, again, two penalties. Um, 
One was for the production of the dark matter, and the other was for the scattering, which was epsilon squared suppressed. Um, we actually had a lot of dark matter that was produced, just most of it didn't scatter. And so that brings me to the last sort of set of experiments that I wanted to talk about quickly, which is how do we get something that, like Babar, is scaling like epsilon squared, but in a fixed target environment, so that we can access the lower couplings that you need to, to be sensitive to low mass, to most of the parameter space for low mass thermal dark matter. And the idea behind this is to exploit the kinematics that I told you about, but in a different way. Give up completely on detecting the dark matter, and instead use the kinematics of the recoiling electron that was implied by everything that I just told you. So I told you that the dark photon carries most of the, kinetic, of the energy of the beam electron. That means the recoiling electron carried a much smaller energy fraction. Um, so typical kinematics of the recoiling electron energy much less than the energy of the beam. And it carries a PT that looks like roughly like a geometric mean of the electron and A prime masses. And If you design a detector right, that, those can be powerful handles. So what you can imagine is you have now a thin target, an electron beam coming in, and then it's going to scatter produce dark matter. We won't try to see it. But we'll try to use the fact that the recoil got a little bit of a kick, and probably most significantly, its energy is much less than the energy of the incoming beam electron. And that's, it looks like most of the energy then in that collision just disappeared. So the rest of the energy is missing. Now you need a kind of peculiar kind of detector in order to see that. Because if you don't design your detector right, either you won't see that recoiling electron, or you won't be able to see other stuff that's carrying away the energy. In particular, if I tried to look for this energy loss at, say, E137, it would be useless. I never see that recoiling electron. It has 200 meters of hill to go through before I measure anything. So I can't do that at a beam dump experiment. Most other experiments that you look at look for. They have a beam pipe going in, then they have a target, they have a bunch of instrumentation around here, and then you have a little, you have a big target chamber around your target, but then there's another beam pipe going through, and this goes into some dump. And in addition to most of the electron beam going through that going straight down to the dump. You could also have photons produced in the target that carry 90% from a hard BREM event. So instead of this dark matter production process, I just have my electrons scatter off the target and produce a photon with E gamma equals 0 0.9 times E beam. And now the energy of the electron it's just 0.1 E beam. That looks a lot like this signal, unless I can see the photon. But typically, those Bremsterlung photons would go right down the beam pipe to the dump, completely miss your detector. And so that's not an observable signal. The only way to see this signal is to instrument directly in the path of the beam, which is not something that people usually do because they're working with two high current beams, and that would absolutely fry their detectors. Um, HPS had to do a lot of work to make sure, and you know, the, the LHC detectors to try to get within a sort of millimeter scale, their, their innermost tracking layers within a millimeter scale of the beam, um, with, with movable 
movable with mechanical movers for the sensors and stuff like that. But you don't put your detectors in the beam, they get fried. Um, so to detect this, you do want to put your detector directly in the beam. So what I want to think about is I'll erase this detector. It is useless for this physics. I want to think about something that looks sort of like a core taken out of an LHC detector. So I'll put some trackers in here. I'll put an eCal in here, and then an HCal behind it. And I actually probably want to extend that HCal to cover a little bit more solid angle. Um, straight in front of the beam. So now, if I have that Bremsstrahlung process, I get a photon that goes right through, showers in the eCal. And as long as I can actually measure it, and know that that photon was associated with this electron. That can be used to tell the difference between this photon background and the dark matter signal. So this is tricky for a couple of reasons. Um, but let me just start with, you roughly need one electron at a time for this to work. Because normally you get pile up when two protons at, at a collider experiment, for example, when you have multiple sets of protons hitting each other. But there's a lot more protons that go through that don't interact and don't give you pileup. Here, every electron that you send into your experiment goes into the detector. So every electron you send in is a potential pileup electron. Um, and you can try to spatially separate them by enlarging the beam. But maybe that gets you from one electron to order one electron at a time. Modern detectors have a sort of frame rate, a, a, a rate at which they can detect collisions that's similar to what the LHC repetition rate is. So one collision for 25 nanoseconds is sort of the max. You actually can't find too many beams that will deliver low current of electrons at this rate. Um, so actual beam availability is a limitation for this kind of search right now. Um, there is a beam line being developed at Slack that's sort of purpose made for this kind of experiment um, that's really well suited to this low current, uh, high repetition rate kind of setup. Um, the only experiment doing anything like this idea right now is at CERN using a, a tertiary beam of electrons from, from the SPS proton beam, which has a significantly lower rate than this. This is sort of the theoretical maximum. If you had an, ideal, an idealized beam ready for you, what could a modern detector handle? One collision per 25 nanoseconds. So that sort of tells you that the number of electrons that you can imagine getting in such a detector on a one year run is something like that frequency is um, 4 10 to the 7 hertz times 3 10 to the 7 seconds in a year. And that gives you something like 10 to the 15 electrons. So the number of electrons that we'll be dealing with for any experiment like this is already five orders of magnitude lower than what E137 can do. But instead of having to pay a penalty for detection that's at best at the 310 to the minus 7 level, you could detect an order one fraction of the dark matter production events. So this is called a missing momentum um, concept. If you get rid of the tracking and just have the electron hit directly on an eCal, it's usually referred to as missing energy. And the sort of main experiments trying to realize this are NA64 and LDMX. And then there's also two proposals, NA64 mu at CERN, uh, 
which is basically doing the trackerless version of this with a muon beam, and M3, which is a sort of early stage proposal at uh, Fermilab, which is trying to do the same thing with a muon beam and with tracking. Um, if you can saturate this limit, this 10 to the 15 electrons, then you can end up getting a significantly better epsilon sensitivity than these, uh, than the beam temp experiments that I've been discussing so far. Um, so I'll just pull up a plot now that shows a lot more projections. This is basically every experiment looking for light dark matter accelerators that's, uh, that's being discussed at Snowmass. Um, so quite a few. You can see where belt two expects to get with early data. That's that sort of cyan line near the top. Um, huh? So this, remember I was saying that at low mass, so this is their full data set sensitivity. And I don't know if you remember, I was saying that the low mass signals look a lot like a missing photon background. And it's not clear how well they'll be able to reject or measure that background at, again, this is a, thousand, a factor of a thousand extrapolation from data in this trigger that has ever been accumulated. And so it's not clear what that sensitivity limit will be below this, below this scale, which is where, where the signal starts looking like you're peaking this mixed, mixed photon background. And so that's why they stop the curve here. Whereas this, they're pretty confident they can do using low luminosities and just doing a more efficient analysis than Mabar because they have a more hermetic detector. Um, most of the lines on here are other beam dump experiments. You can see there's a lot of ideas to, that basically as you build, you know, go from ton to kiloton experiment, beam dump uh, neutrino experiments, you can get new sensitivity by looking for dark matter in them. Um, as well as some proposals that just focus more on increasing the increasing the yield from the dump. Um, and BDX is a forward electron beam dump experiment that's basically trying to one-up E137 directly um, at Jefferson Lab. And then LDMX here is an example of missing momentum at the, the experiment that's trying to do missing momentum basically at that, at that theoretical limit of the rapid deposition of electrons. Yeah. So these, so, right, so that is the dark photon mixing with the rho and omega, which for some of the visible searches, that made things worse because you had a lot of background from their leptonic decays. Um, for these invisible searches, the fact that the dark photon can mix with them actually enhances the signal. Um, and so that, in, the, in, a, in a proton beam experiment, that mixing enhances the proton Bremsstrahlung rate, for example. Um, in the LDMX case, it's a totally different production mechanism, and you can ask Kevin about it, because um, this, is, this is something that Kevin worked on, figured out recently. Um, any other questions on the plot before I move on? I did promise to show you, I guess we're, we're out of time. Uh, so I'll just make a couple of quick remarks. So I did promise to show you something about how varying the uh, mass ratios changes sensitivity of experiments. And this is one attempt to, I'll post these with a reference added to the paper that these plots are from, um, which I guess I forgot. One attempt to look at, if you fix a dark, dark matter mass, you vary the mass ratio of the dark photon to the dark matter. How are these sensitivities changing? How is the thermal target changing? The thermal target, as I mentioned, is relatively independent of R, above R of a few, but then it has this resonant enhancement right near two. Um, and then you run into this non-thermal regime where like forbidden or not forbidden dark matter dominates. Um, and the general point is just that covering large R is easier than covering small R 
in general, the large mass scale separation thermal parameter space has already been probed by uh, NA64 of the bar. But these small mass ratios are a very reasonable thing to think about, right? I mean, if the mass of the dark photon and the dark matter is coming from a parametrically from the same source, then you'd really expect their masses to be close to each other and not necessarily degenerate or anything, but within a factor of a few. And that's the parameter space that's still to be explored. And this is just another view of that, where you've fixed epsilon to the thermal target, um, or fixed y to the thermal target, I should say, and are now looking at the plane of dark matter mass versus mass ratio at where that line has been covered by different experiments and where it will be covered by some of the future experiments. And these obviously include fewer experiments as sort of representative examples than the snow mass figure that I just showed you. I wanted to end, I mean, I'm happy to talk more about backgrounds at LDMX and how the sort of design works. Um, I love that stuff, but this is also not a school on photonuclear interactions. So, <laughs> Um, so I think I'll skip that. Um, but I did want to stress sort of where do I see the open problems here um, for, you know, for young people to think about. I think there's actually a lot of room for new creative ideas here um, in three directions. One is production modes. I mentioned that Kevin had just recently noticed this Maison related production mode for LDNX. Um, there's also relatively recent this, this idea of the positron annihilation that I showed in the E137 plot, that's a relatively recent observation. I think there's still a lot of room for new production mechanisms that people have missed so far um, and for realizing that they're actually important for some of these experiments. You kind of need to know the bestiary of experimental techniques in order to be able to think about, well, here's my production mode, where might it be useful? And the bestiary of signals. Also new experiments. Um, I think the, uh, the forward experiments that have been proposed at colliders in recent years are a really exciting and new idea. Okay, that's maybe over the last five years, um, but, but still, still active new ideas there. And then I mentioned briefly this dark quest experiment that's uh, actually really amazing. This experiment was designed to measure charm quark PDFs using J psi decays to mu plus V minus. And people realized that not just for dark photons, but for other more minimal models, this could actually be very mildly tweaked to become a very sensitive detector for displaced dimuon pairs with gamma C taus at the 10 meter scale. And so thinking about like what, what kinds of detectors can be repurposed for this kind of analysis or modified for this kind of analysis is another area where I think there's a lot of room for innovations that have a big impact. And then also thinking about different signal models. I focused here on the dark photon and most of the, most of the literature focuses on the dark photon. Um, I think things like the Higgs and neutrino portals are also really interesting. They have some interesting parameter space that's much less explored. And there's probably also more beyond that. Um, so thinking about other signals, by the way, for the Higgs portal, Everything I told you about electron beams is probably useless. You really want to go to hadron beams just because they have access to a strange quark PDF, for example. Um, they produce muons through decays, and those are much more efficient sources of anything that couples to particle mass than an electron beam is. Um, and then I think Philip mentioned this, but I'll just, just say it one more time. We know that light dark matter models to be viable need to have velocity suppression, some kind of velocity suppression in their annihilation. And it's not guaranteed, but fairly generic that some, a lot of those models also have a suppression in their scattering cross sections at low velocities too. And if you're dealing with a dark matter model that has a velocity suppressed scattering cross section and a velocity suppressed annihilation cross section, you're not really going to see it in direct detection. You're not going to see it in indirect detection. The way to probe that kind of model and get your first handle on it is almost certainly at accelerators. Um, so they could be really important to dark matter discovery. And thinking through the different possibilities for this um, is, I think, really important to understanding that 
broader window of possibilities for dark matter physics. And it's something where relatively small, low cost, shorter timescale experiments, um, really new ideas and repurposing of experiments designed for other things can go a long way. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a really fun area to try to learn more about. And I'll just close there. Thank you all. Thank you.